Now, according to an independent research organization, who owns whom? There are over a thousand EU companies active in South Africa. But what about local content requirements? What sort of impact is it having on certain EU companies? Let's find out. Laura Lynn Kaziboni joins me now live via Zoom. She's an economist at DNA Economics, uh, a private economic consulting firm based in Pretoria. Laura Lynn conducted a study on behalf of the EU SA Partners for Growth Project, which is an EU funded program aimed at maximizing bilateral trade and investment between the EU and South Africa. Laura Lynn, welcome to the agenda. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Great to have you on the program. Firstly, so that we're all on the same page, break down for us what local content requirements entails. Okay, uh, so if you look at your legislation, so the Provincial Procurement Policy Framework Act, or the Re uh, Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Program, uh, they include in there, you know, what they call local content requirements, which are essentially, you know, a way of saying a proportion of, you know, the project value or a product that's going to be procured by state-owned companies uh, should contain inputs from South Africa. Right. So these inputs could be in the form of raw materials or labor um, that's specifically found in South Africa and could also include, you know, certain manufacturing processes um, um, such as forging or, you know, bending and w welding steel. So it's essentially to say right. a portion of that project or that product should be manufactured or assembled in South Africa using South African resources. So, for instance, the, the requirement for companies to source local parts, etc., correct? Yes, uh, you're right. If you can just speak a little louder or just turn up the All volume right. a bit. We'll tell audio to, to sort that out. Uh, Laurel, talk to us about these requirements and its impact on certain EU companies active in South Africa. What did your research find in terms of the, what to say, the design and implementation of local content regulations in South Africa? Uh, when it comes to design, you know, a lot of companies did um, acknowledge, you know, the importance of having uh, local content requirements in a country like South Africa that's trying to industrialize and ensure that, you know, the benefits are broad based. Um, and, you know, the policy implementation itself is a little bit confusing. Yeah. Um, so it's not clear as to, you know, how this local content will be calculated along the value chain. Um, and it's not clear at what point um, the verification or um, exemption processes can be done um, but with that said you know there are mixed outcomes you know that came from the study um, both from a positive and from a negative perspective well talk to us about that I understand that the study of the survey of 14 EU companies yes. operating across several sectors in South Africa what were some of the other major findings uh, so from a positive note, you know, increasing, you know, domestic content in goods um, that are being bought by government amid some of, you know, government policy expectations such as attracting investment to South Africa. So if you look at the renewable energy program, um, about 42 billion investment is accounted for by EU businesses. And, you know, when they set up in South Africa, it means they're employing um, local, um, local staff. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, there's a direct job creation there. Um, and what's even more importantly is that um, this facilitates technology um, and skills transfer. Yeah. And, you know, in South Africa, we were trying to catch up um, to middle income countries or technologically advanced countries. It becomes very important. Well, um, and from an yeah. ex Carry on, mm. carry on, Lord. And I was going to say, from an export perspective, you know, we've been able to increase exports to from South Africa into the African continent. And this obviously increases domestic resources and generates foreign earnings. Um, but unfortunately, you know, some of, you know, the delays in auctioning the next renewable energy program or signing the power purchase agreements by ESCOM uh, has meant that, you know, no economic activity has been going on um, mm -hmm. and firms have been unable to recoup um, investments. So ultimately, you know, our study sort of, you know, pegged um, the cost of this policy at about 10 percent. Um, so what that means is that the cost of production has gone up by 10 percent because of such um weak or fragmented implementation of the policy. Right. I, I just wanted to jump on the, the issue of skills development as well as technology transfer. Uh, through your studies, yeah. did you find that there was 
this appreciation of South Africa's industrial and transformation policy imperatives and the need, I guess, to support skills development and technology transfer? Yes. Uh, so if you look at it, you know, the EU is or EU countries rather are quite renowned for having um, technologically advanced countries or economies. Um, so when they set up here, they're able to, you know, bring the technology that they use in the EU in South Africa. Um, and the companies have implemented uh, initiatives where South African staff are able to uh, go abroad and learn um, engineering and design skills um, on the front of it in, you know, Germany or in Netherlands. Yeah. Um, so that's quite an important way of, you know, developing local skills so that um, skills transfer within South Africa permeates across um, the whole country. So, you know, that was some of, you know, the positive benefits right. that came from the study. You touched yeah. on something a little earlier that I want to explore. Uh, what did the survey yeah. or study find with regards to public infrastructure investment, as well as the renewable energy independent power producer proc uh, procurement program? Mm -hmm. So prior to, you know, COVID happening, um, I think if you look at um, National Treasury's public, inf uh, public infrastructure spend, it had been on a downward trend for the last three, four years. Um, and for companies or countries that had invested in the country on the back of these, you know, government or policy decisions, it's quite difficult to try and recoup. So if you look at the integrated resource plan, which maps out um, the demand energy for the country right, right up until 2030, and there have been certain deviations there um, by the Department of Energy. So if com companies set up here in South Africa mm. expecting that, you know, there will be wind programs that are going to be rolled out on an annual basis and that doesn't happen, um, that definitely affects, you know, their um, investment decisions. Right. And in the end, it may, you know, lead to certain companies closing down. And, you know, this has actually happened. So what's the way forward i guess is the big question i mean you you would agree that supporting skills development and and technology transfer which enhances the domestic knowledge and skills base is very very important in the country like south africa talk to us about these companies constructive engagement so far with the south african government on its approach to uh, to local content regulations Okay. Um, at this point, I, unfortunately, I can't speak to, you know, some of the engagements that mm. the companies are doing themselves. Um, but based on our study, um, in implementing local content policies, it's crucial to understand um, economic feasibility of, you know, certain sectors and identify sectors where there are long-term benefits that outweigh the short um, there are definitely potential gains, you know, from localization, and it heavily depends on the nature of sector. Um, and it then becomes important for government to consider, you know, issues like the extent to which local inputs are available at a reasonable price, uh, the scale and frequency of, you know, government demand, um, as well as the clarity and transparency of the rules and regulations that govern uh, local content requirements. Right. Um, you know, with the economic reconstruction and recovery plan, you know, being rolled out soon. Um, the government earlier this week uh, mentioned that, you know, they aim to attract investment in infrastructure of about one trillion over the next four years. Mm. Um, and, you know, for such a project, there's no doubt that um, this infrastructure investment will be tied to local content requirements. You know, so while foreign investors, you know, do acknowledge that um, local content policy is important, um, that, you know, engagement um, that's open and constructive is quite important um, to ensure that, you know, going forward, um, this investment can yield positive results that can benefit the whole country. Laurel Lynn, we fast run out of time, but we appreciate your time and insight. Be well. Awesome. Thank you for having me. All right. That was uh, Laurel Lynn Kaziboni there. She's an economist at DNA Economics.